Hi, this is Kate Penner, and this is the first video for Math 23. The purpose of these videos is really for you as a student in the course to be able to adequately prepare for Tuesday's lecture or to be able to do some more extensive review on particular topics that you found fuzzy as you're working on the homework, as you're talking with students in the course, uh, or if you're studying for an exam. In general, I'll try to split the videos up into smaller pieces so that you're able to easily search through them. In this case, for our first video, this is a coverage of 1.1 fields and field axioms, which is everything you'll need to know for the very first R script of the course to make sense to you. The subject matter of the R script, that is. So let's get started. A field is a set of elements for which the familiar operations of addition and multiplication are defined and behave in the usual way. You have been working with fields for over 10 years now, believe it or not. The real numbers are a field. They're probably the most familiar field that you're acquainted with. We're going to go through some other examples of really well-known, commonly used fields later, but first let's talk about the nine axioms for a field. And an axiom is a basic premise. So these are the nine properties of fields. All right, so the first one is that addition is commutative. You know that basically order doesn't matter. A plus B equals B plus A. Addition is associative, so parentheses used to group various elements in a sum doesn't really matter. So A plus B quantity plus C is equal to A plus B plus C quantity. Now the additive identity here. Oh, what is this? This backwards E, this upside down A, this sideways pitchfork. Very confusing. So what these symbols mean is, while well, they represent mathematical phrases or quantifiers. We use a lot of particular phrases very frequently, so often that we want to make a shortcut. This backwards E is short for there exists. All right, so what do we have so far? There exists zero, some element zero, such that now we have this upside down A right here. The upside down A, whenever you see that, that means the phrase for all. Okay, let's write that down. You'll be seeing these symbols a lot in this particular class and in higher level mathematics for the rest of your career. These are phrases that we use all the time. So, so far we have there exists this zero element such that for all little a, now this guy right here, the sideways pitchfork, that means element of. What do you mean element of? I know. So it means for all little a that are elements of f, and remember that italicized f is the field. So for all little a that are elements of f. You could also think of it as in, for all little a in the field f. So let's write that down, element of. All right, from start to finish, let's see if this now makes sense here. Well, we have, there exists this zero element such that for all little a that are elements of the field f, zero plus a equals a plus zero equals a. Makes sense to me, right? All right, let's take these nice little pieces of a mathematical abbreviation and see if we can make sense of rule number four, that there's an additive identity. All right, we have our upside down A, so that means for all little a that are in the field F, there exists a minus A. There's some element called minus A, such that minus A plus A is equal to A plus minus A, which is equal to zero. Make sense so far? These rules should seem pretty common sense. All right, let's see here. Number five is that multiplication is associative. 
Very similar to addition, it doesn't matter if you have a product of multiple things, it doesn't matter how you group them, the order of multiplying things together doesn't change the outcome. You can group A and B and take that product and multiply it by C, or you can group B and C and multiply those together and take that product and multiply it by A, you'll get the same thing. And multiplication is commutative. Order does not matter when we're multiplying two things together. You can do A times B or B times A. It'll be the same thing if you are working in a field. All right, seven, multiplicative identity. Here we have our strange little witchcraft signs again. All right, there exists some element that looks like one. There exists a one such that for all little a that are elements of the field, one times little a is equal to little a. Okay, and multiplicative inverse. Well, now we have a new symbol, this right here. This is set notation. So what this means is that this is a set. It is a set of just one element. It is the set of just the zero element all by itself. So when we take a look at this expression, when we say f, the whole field, minus the zero element, that means everything in the field but the zero element. All right, so now, now let's go back and read through that whole thing. So I'll make a note here that when we use these curly brackets, inside this is a set. Okay, so this means for all little a, for all the elements uh, in the field f, minus the zero element. So this means for all of the elements in the field except for the zero element. There exists some element called A inverse, such that A inverse times A equals one. Think about that for a minute. For all A in, this is the difference, this is the entire field, minus the zero element, so everything but the zero element in the field. So for all A, so for all the elements that are in the set that is the entire field minus the zero element, each one has an inverse such that its product with its inverse is equal to one. All right, and last is the distributive law, where if we take A, we multiply it times the sum of B and C, that's equal to the product of A and B plus the product of A and C. Well, you guys are actually uh, pretty familiar with a lot of different fields. Some of the most popular ones have their own notation. So when you're talking about a particular field, some of them are so well known that their set gets a special symbol. So everyone just knows what you're talking about. This Q here, this weird scripted Q, which is actually exactly how you should write it on your paper. You should write it like a script. If I were writing my problem set, I would write this. I would write something like that. So that's really what it should look like by hand on a piece of paper. The rational numbers are a field. They obey these nine axioms. The real numbers are a field. They obey these nine axioms. The complex numbers are a field. And note what we have not put on here. The integers. Now think about that. Why aren't the integers a field? Which one of these rules can the integers not follow? Take a moment, think about it. Axiom number eight is the rule that the integers cannot follow. This guy right here, the multiplicative inverse. Remember that in a field, every element has a multiplicative inverse that is also in the field. In the real numbers, the multi a multiplicative inverse of a real number is another real number. For the rational numbers, the multiplicative inverse of a rational number is another rational number. Same thing for the complex numbers. For an integer, is that true? It is true for two special integers, one and negative one. Their inverse uh, is is another integer. But what if I gave you six? What's the in multiplicative inverse of six? Well, it's one sixth. And is one sixth an integer? Nope, it's not. And so because uh, the multiplicative inverse axiom doesn't hold 
for the integers, the integers are not a field. There is a way that we can kind of manipulate the integers into a finite field. Let's take a look at this. Finite fields are uh, written as z sub p. They are constructed for any prime number p as follows. I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. All right, so the way to manipulate the integers into a type of field, which is a finite field, is that we break up the set of all the integers into p subsets. Now, I'll do a concrete example of this in a moment, but let's take a look at this. Each subset is named after the remainder when any of its elements is divided by p, and p will be given to you in a lot of the examples that we'll be doing in class. So you have these subsets a sub p, and a is written in these brackets. Well, what does that mean? Well, note, again, we have a lot of new set notation. Remember that these curly brackets mean we're talking about a set. So that means the set m, the set of elements m, such that, that's what that straight line means. Sometimes we don't write such that uh, out in words. The straight line means such that. Let's actually make a note of that over on the side here. All right, so we have the set of elements m such that m equals n times p plus a, and n is an element of the integers. Well, for some of you, this may look a little familiar. Don't worry, it didn't at all when I was a student in Math 23. You might have recognized this as mo the modulus system. What this is basically saying is that the set of integers represented by a sub p over here are all of the integers that give a remainder of a when they are divided by p. That's what that means. Remember remainders? Remember when we did long division? Oh, let me say that one more time. So a sub p uh, is the set of all of the integers that give a remainder a when divided by p. So when I write something like, hmm, let's see here, 2 sub 7 here, so we're now working in z7, that's the infinite set of integers that give a remainder of 2 when divided by 7. So if we're just talking about the positive ones, there are negative ones too, but let's just think about the positive ones just to list a couple. We have 9, we have 16, we have 23. It goes on and on and on. It's an infinite set, but that gives you an idea of what we mean when we're talking about a finite field and what the notation of a finite field looks like and what it means. So say we're in Z7, Again, 2 sub 7 means the set of integers that give a remainder of 2 when they're divided by 7. All right, well, when we're in this particular uh, finite field, addition pretty much works the exact same way. When you have a sub p and b sub p, that's equal to a plus b quantity sub p. So when you have uh, an element from the set that has a remainder of a when divided by p and an element from the set that has a remainder of b when divided by p, that's going to be, their sum is going to be equal to an element from the set uh, that has a remainder of a plus b when divided by p. We can define multiplication very similarly, where a in the finite field c sub p times b in the finite field is equal to a times b expressed in the finite field. So a and z7 times b and z7 is equal to a times b and z7, or whichever prime number you're, you've been given to work with. We'll be doing a ton of examples of this in class, but for the most part, this is all the information that's necessary to understand every application that's in the first R script.